Welcome in to another edition of the KSO Show. Mason Voth, Derek Young here with you from K-State Online. As uh, we get ready to start another week of the college football season, week three already coming our way. Uh, I don't want to sound too much like the, uh, I won't call him great, but the the infamous Mike Francesa. There are some hilarious clips out there just pushed together of an entire season of him going, boy, Week, week two, it, it goes by fast when it gets here. Week four already. Oh, it, it, And it's just that's how football season works. You wait all that time for it to get here. And by the end of the season, it feels like it's been, it's been a while that, you, that you've been in the middle of it. But it just takes so long to come, and, and then it eventually gets here, and it flies by. So week three on the horizon, K-State getting ready for their first road trip of the season to go to Columbia to take on Missouri. We will have plenty to discuss about the Tigers and the Wildcats all throughout the week. Uh, but first, we'll, we'll go and, and take one final look back at the Wildcats' 42-13 to victory over Troy that took place over the weekend. K-State, a little sluggish out of the gates, but basically from the final drive of the first half to the rest of the game, the Wildcats dominated. They did what you would expect a team like K-State to do to a team out of the Sun Belt. And uh, K State now two and zero, stayed at number fifteen in the polls. Dy, where uh, where are your thoughts on what K State was able to make happen over the weekend? They took care of business, much like in week one, got hit in the mouth in week two against Troy, where that didn't happen against Semo, but they responded well and then raced out to another comfortable win. So, kind of like what Chris Kleiman and his players said after the game, Kansas State probably needed to get punched in the mouth at least once before the Missouri game to kind of be ready for that feeling. And he was pleased with the response. So I, that's kind of how I would summarize it. Some good things about everywhere and some little things to correct here and there. But now we're up. We're on Missouri Super Bowl and we're on uh, for Kansas State. This is probably where the season starts. Yeah, no, that's that's absolutely right. And you know, we we talked about it on the Sunday show, myself, Drew, and Fan. But I think you got exactly what you wanted out of the game with Troy, where you got a little bit more resistance than what Semo gave you, and a little bit of adversity that you had to overcome. You did it, and then you just hammered them, and you got out of there with a nice, clean victory. A lot of good that came out of the game over the weekend. It's been addressed plenty now by us on the Sunday show, and also by you guys on the Three Ma podcast. So we'll dive in, take one final look at this game from a different perspective. Each week we do our overs and unders for the game, where we're going on those. Drew setting the lines for us. And uh, we we got our first uh, under to hit immediately. It became clear this was going to happen. Keegan Johnson over under 23 and a half total snaps. Um, I don't know what the final number ended up being, but I know that it did not get to 24. It was 16, so... Okay, while, more than I thought. Yeah, while we all nailed it, um, probably a little bit closer than at least you or I thought mm-hmm. it would be, we all nailed that one comfortably. And just for the Kansas State perspective on it, probably exactly what you wanted. He got his feet wet and even more snaps than Uso Sayamalo took mm-hmm. in the opener against Simo. And I thought Keegan Johnson, when he was out there, looked good. I mean, he immediately – you knew he was out there on that drive because he made some catches – Almost had a touchdown, uh, very close to, to extending the ball and getting it in, and, and made some other nice catches uh, while he was on the field for the Wildcats. So it was a solid debut for Keegan Johnson, given the fact that he was nursing a little bit of an injury. And now you feel better, at least, about him going and seeing the field uh, this coming weekend against Missouri because K-State is going to need more help as they start to play better competition. So uh, I think right on the dot for what you would have wanted out of Keegan Johnson last week. And you hope he can at least double that snap count and get into the 30s against Missouri. But it was clear from the get-go, he provides an element that Kansas State otherwise probably doesn't have at the receiver position, though Jaden Jackson starting to be that guy a little bit, I think. Yeah, Jaden Jackson is a guy that uh, has really impressed uh, through the first two weeks. We, we've noted it a couple times, but uh, he became the first player since Darren Sproles to open up the season in back-to-back games with the first offensive touchdown of the game. So uh, kind of interesting to, to take note of that and, and how Jaden it ended Jackson, up working Darren out. Darren Sproles, yeah, can't, can't tell the difference between those two. I, I get them mixed up all the time. <laughs> yeah, not, not a lick of difference between uh, those two guys. 
Uh, the, the next one that we had going uh, was the true freshman to record a snap was set at four and a half. All three of us took the over, and then we started to kind of do the math in our heads on this, on how it might work out, and we realized, oh, this is going to be a pretty tight one. Yeah, and I think the over hit, I believe. So we know we got the linebackers, Asa Newsom and Austin Romain. We know we got the safety, Jack Fabris. The receiver, mm -hmm. Chase Brown, was there a bit? Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like there was. I'll have to confirm. I feel like I remember specifically Drew making a comment about it. Uh, and, and getting a fifth. So it might have re been recap again team. who you who you who you had on there. I know I have Chase Brown. Yep. Uh sorry, Austin Romaine. Yep. Asa Newsom. And Jack Jack, Jack, Jack Fabris. Fabris. That's four. If there was a fifth, it might have been a true freshman on special teams. Did Kenigel Thomas play special teams? Maybe? Yeah. I think that I think that might have been it. Uh, yes, that that was it. I remember during the game you were saying that. So there you go, five. Uh, that number obviously refined down a little bit from game number one. Um, it, do you think that's probably where we see the number stick around as the season goes on? That four or five mark, um, or does it get smaller than that uh, as they they get into to better competition? Maybe try and tighten up who is seeing the field. No, I think I think that's probably the number because I think I think Jack Fabris, uh, um, Austin Romain, Asa Newsom are definitely playing. They're in mm -hmm. the rotation, in my opinion. And if you're only going to throw Jace Brown out there for four or five snaps, I would imagine you have every intention of not redshirting him, or else I don't know that you would have wasted those snaps just for a second of four games. So I think those four are it. Um, but I, I see it growing, like Kenijo Thomas, mm -hmm. whether it be on special teams. Trey Spivey, I still wouldn't rule out him getting in there every now and then. Avery Johnson, right? Joe yep. Jackson. Uh, Chidi Obeizer had a great game um, in his limited snaps in, in game one. So I, I, I still think there's room for it to expand um, rather than deflate. Well, and I think you, you look at the game against Troy and realize that uh, for some of those guys, K-State was able to save a game of getting him out there, push it off down the line. And for dudes that you want to have red shirt, you've got three games left for, for them. And for some of them, like you mentioned, Jace Brown might indicate that he's not going to be red shirting this year. And, and K-State is, is ready to have him. Injuries happen. Um, mm -hmm. Jace Brown's probably one injury away from maybe being in the rotation. Joe Jackson's probably one injury away from being in the rotation. So, uh, you take those injuries into account, maybe even for Chidi, one injury away from being in the rotation. And I think we're, we're probably around four right now. Mm -hmm. But again, uh, injuries happen in football. And, and maybe that's also why you can use some of these guys as a, as a rotational piece when that happens and still redshirt. Them. So that, that might have been part of the calculus against Troy. All right, next one. Daniel Green over under six and a half tackles. Uh, the way this one worked out, we were all on the under here. That's exactly what happened. Uh, four tackles for Daniel Green. Um, it, it's clear at this point, at least to me, you know, Daniel Green obviously had a lot of the buzz and everything else going for him. But it's clear now that it's not just Daniel Green uh, that, that is the star at linebacker. It's Austin Moore who has taken over that role. Uh, but, but what have you made of Daniel Green's start to the season for K-State and uh, what he might be able to do to, to, to be a more active uh, player for, for the Cats? Because I just think it's been a little bit of a, a quiet, ho-hum start for him. A quieter start indeed, but that might also be a product that he's surrounded by some dudes at linebacker now, right? Another year of Austin yeah. Moore, Desmond Purnell is really ele elevating his play at the same linebacker spot. So I would say maybe it's because he was kind of working through an injury part of training camp. And secondly, because they are much better around him. He's, he doesn't have to be the guy every game, so that allows him to be fresher, maybe allows him to be more impactful during the more important games that loom down the road. Sorry, a little bit distracted there. I'm I, not sure I know what the over-under is. It, the UCF kick time was just yeah. released. Not that anyone um, hasn't seen this by the time they watch this, potentially, but Kansas State will host UCF in week four, 7 p.m., a night game on FS1. Yeah, that that was uh, what I was I was pulling up as well, just to to take a look at. But yeah, a night kick for the the Big Twelve opener, Cats and Knights, uh, both teams. 
and, and you know, got, got big wins over the weekend. Uh, uh, so we'll see. Well, that's, that's quite of a, an indoctrination to big 12 football for, for the Knights though. I mean, Bill Snyder family stadium, a potentially undefeated team at night. Yeah. I'll, I'll be interested to uh, see what the rest of the league schedule <laughs> looks like for, for that day, because uh, like Houston and BYU, how their, uh, their whole introduction to the league will end yeah. up coming about. Cause that, that's them. a rough one for the Knights because they're also going to be without starting quarterback, John Rice Plumley as well. Yeah. That makes that a, a lot more gettable at home for K state than it previously uh, would have been. So we'll, uh, we'll have to kind of keep monitoring and seeing how uh, things play out there, but interesting to uh to kind of take stop stock of and uh see how things roll on okay so we'll, we'll roll on then with our overs and unders uh here k-state sacks two and a half we all had the over that did end up hitting in the game um two of them came from khalid duke and then another one tossed in from um nate matlack at the defensive end position and then toby austin saw me he ended up getting one uh his was the one at the end of the game that caused the fumble that K-State was able to uh, pick up as the, the game was kind of bleeding out. Um, not as many sacks as maybe you and I thought could be achieved by K-State. They started a little bit slow with the pass rush, but once the, once it came through, it really came through, and it seemed like K-State was making Gunnar Watson uncomfortable all afternoon. I, I thought the pressure was constant and what we thought it would be. Uh, kind of a quick passing game a little bit. Uh, Troy probably stemmed – the actual statistic, statistic part of that. So uh, it wasn't anything that I didn't expect. I think we got what we expected, just like the stats part of it just didn't come along the way because Troy was pretty much paranoid of it. But Kansas State still got there. And and the exclamation point was the one by Toby Osen you know, You know, if I had a bold prediction, and it's probably one that's a little frowned upon, would be that he hurts a quarterback before the year is over. <laughs> like a quarterback gets hit by him and is not able to take the next nap. Yeah. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll move on. Keep going through all these better week than we thought it was going to be for some of us. Uh, K-State interceptions, one and a half. You and Drew both took the over. I took the under. Um, it yeah. ends up working out. Will Lee, Wildcat, got his uh, <laughs> first interception uh, as a cat and the first one of the season for K-State, but they only came away with the one. This was an area that K-State was really good at last year. I think they ended up finishing second in the Big 12 in interceptions. Um, any concern or what do you make of K-State's slow start enforcing turnovers? No concern, just the bounce of the ball. Uh, uh, they're so fast. Like if I was going to come away with a conclusion so far through the first two games about the defense, one is that they are – over exceeding our expectations by quite a lot. There, there's been no mm -hmm. growing pains, really. Maybe that's a product of Simo and Troy. We'll find out in week three against Missouri, but I would say they're exceeding our expectations by quite a lot. And number two is that if you wanted to compare last year's squad to this year's squad, this is, they were right. They are, the team speed on defense this year is um, significantly and obviously elevated beyond what we saw last year. And that's not to say, Last year's group was slow. They weren't, but this this is just a group that really plays fast, is fast. Typically, when you have that, you can cause a lot of havoc, a lot of disruption. They are. Kansas State's havoc rate is through the roof right now, um, and that's something we know because of KSU underscore fan helping us out in that capacity and letting us know um, where that stands. So typically when that happens, the turnover, you know, you know, they skyrocket as well. We haven't seen that. It's probably a little bit of misfortune to bounce the ball here and there at some at times, and uh, I think that stuff will happen. You'll probably need a maybe more aggressive opponent to do that. We'll see. Um, it would be nice for the because typically these things even out, right? If mm -hmm. you're if you're under what your turnovers for should be, then you're going to have a game where it's it really inflates. Yeah. It'd be nice if it happened week three against Missouri. Well, it did last year against Missouri. Uh, so well, the... <laughs> is is it going to be a monsoon in Columbia? <laughs> yeah, we'll have to we'll have to see how that ends up working out. I, I think it's going to be good. I think it's going to be like our first legit is starting to feel more like football this year, like mid seventies, a uh, little kickoff sunshine there. It'll be good. A uh, final over under, it was 76 and a half for Trayshawn Ward's scrimmage yards. A really good number set by Drew because it, it was close throughout the game on if it was going to happen. I think the final tally ended up being 69 yards for Trayshawn Ward. Uh, K-State 
really, to me, Drew and I both took the over here. You were the only one to take the under, D.Y. This just comes down to the fact that K-State was not able to run the ball like I thought was probably going to be possible in this game. Um, and, you know, we can talk about Treshawn Ward and how he played. I was still impressed there. D.J. Giddens, I thought, was good in what he needed to do. There were a couple times where he basically got touched the second he had the ball, but he was able to, to keep his balance well enough to fight for a few extra yards and still get the first down. I think Treshawn Ward not getting to this number says a lot more about the offensive lines play uh, on Saturday, and that's maybe where I, I want to take things with you real quick on uh, what you make of the offensive line and how they've been able to, to block for the run over the first two weeks. A little bit of a slow start, and we'll see if they have any different answers for week three when they play Missouri. Some of that could be a health situation. Does Christian Duffy, <laughs> excuse me, mm -hmm. does Christian Duffy and John Pistori return to action that, that can make a difference? Maybe it couldn't. But sometimes right now, one of the solutions is sliding Cooper BB out to right tackle. And obviously, they're they're not as good of a run blocking team when that's the case. They're they're much better on the ground when Cooper BB is is at left guard, and especially on the left side, you put BB and KT Leviston together, and you don't have to worry about the right side. I think that's the ideal situation, and and maybe they have the the last year starters. You know, when they run out against Missouri in week three, a slow start. I'm not panicking. I you know I would like to see a move in the right direction in the very near future to to alleviate some of the consternation that is fair at this point. But like you said, I took the under on the Trayshawn Ward production. I didn't think it was going to be a product of the offensive line, but credit to Troy too, that that was something they wanted to take away. And for the most part, they did. Yeah. It, you know, it was, uh, it was close 69 yards, just uh, eight yards shy of what I needed from him. So uh, I'll keep holding on to my Trayshawn Ward stock and expecting a big game to come from him uh, at some point in the very, very near future. Moving on now, we can uh, put Troy behind us and we can look ahead to Missouri as they are the matchup this weekend for the Wildcats. Two teams met last year. Like you said, it was a monsoon. There were weather delays and a lot of other things that were not conducive to playing a clean and easy football game. K-State really wasn't even throwing the ball yet at that point in the season, and they still dominated the game, really 40-6, to six, but you know who, Mr. Dorkwitz, decided that he needed a little time out at the end to get that last-minute score. It also took uh, maybe a bogus penalty to save the, the Tigers some face there. Um, this is a Missouri team that I thought was probably going to be a little bit better this season than what K-State saw last year. Also, Missouri got better as last season went on. Like K-State probably saw the worst version, version of Missouri in that game. But the Tigers did not inspire confidence with the outside world or their own fans on Saturday when Middle Tennessee went into Faroe Field and, and honestly could have beaten them. And credit to you, you pointed out in best bets, hey, take the Blue Raiders plus 20 and a half or whatever that big number was because uh, Missouri is looking ahead of their Super Bowl. And I think that we learned that this game is Missouri's Super Bowl this year. It is a winnable game against a marquee opponent that kicked your butt a season ago. You get it at home. Uh, we'll see what the Tigers bring to the table. Yeah, I, I, I might have made a few of you rich if, if you took me up. Uh, I, not only did I say Middle Tennessee plus 20 and a half that cashed with relative ease, I said, you know, the, the K-State, the biggest lead of the game, I think was what, set a 20 and a half maybe? Yep. Uh, and obviously that was, and that was yeah. an easy one as well. I said, I think Troy under 16 and a half, another easy mm -hmm. one. So uh, hopefully I get some royalty fee fees yeah. on, on these bets that, that I'm handing out. Look, you're right. Um, Missouri stumbled last week. I kind of expect them to stumble last week. They Kansas State probably did get one of the worst versions of Missouri last year, especially since they seem to want nothing to do with the weather, and, and Kansas State was just the tougher team because of that. But this year, I think you're getting the best version of Missouri. If they, if they are going to have a game where they show out and play their best, even if with it being early in the season, I think it's probably this one. They've had this game circled on their calendar. This is their Super Bowl. Them almost tripping up to Middle Tennessee actually confirms to me that they are they've been focusing on this one. Mm -hmm. um, because if they if they really overlook excuse me if they really overlooked Middle Tennessee, that means they were looking to this one. I I think I think Kansas State's getting their best shot. 
Yeah. Uh, everybody, DY keeps choking on his uh, his morning beer that he's uh, drinking. <laughs> if you're watching on the YouTube, uh, if you're listening, you probably think he's actually drinking beer. He is confirmed with me at his apple juice. Yeah. Uh, just so everybody's clear on that. But it, he did show up and he was immediately getting in front of it because I wanted to make sure I didn't think that uh, he was just already uh, getting into it on a Monday morning. So must have been a rough day yesterday with, with the NFL bets if you were – dipping into the sauce that early it was actually a great day because the packers even without aaron Rodgers, still did to the bears what they always do to the bears yeah that was uh that was pretty funny justin fields he can go join and ride the bus with dave aranda uh and the bus would be titled frauds <laughs> so there you go uh what what are some of the storylines we need to watch for this game with missouri this coming weekend for k-state obviously we just hit on th- probably the biggest one like Rematch from last year, this is a big deal to Missouri, this game. Um, but from the K-State perspective, what goes into this game and, and what's one or two things that you kind of need to see the Wildcats prove? Yeah, it touched on some of it, uh, just the fact that this feels like this is where the season starts, it being Missouri Super Bowl. The injury stuff, Christian Duffy, Jared Oakley, Jump a story. how close are they? Can they see the field? So those jump out. But also, what else haven't we seen, right? I mean, Kansas State, Colin Klein, you have to imagine they're holding some stuff back. I mean, I know Trayshawn Ward threw a touchdown to Will Howard against SEMO when you're up by four touchdowns. So what else are they really being conservative? Probably not in general, but I imagine there's some interesting wrinkles and concepts within play calls that they can incorporate that they haven't yet because they didn't want it on tape, want to catch Mizzou off guard, so to speak. You know, even defensively, you see Toby Osinsami and Khalid Duke They lined up next to one another last week and caused some pass rush. Uh, Ben Sinnott is clearly a matchup that you can exploit at times too and be creative with him. Adding Keegan Johnson and maybe an an increased workload there opens him up more because if if you're going to just sell out to stop Ben Sinnott like Troy did, then you can get hurt if a wide receiver is emerging enough and and can extend the field. Obviously, Jaden Jackson did that a couple times, but it wasn't as consistent. I think you can do that consistently if you have Keegan Johnson there as well. and Or if Keegan Johnson is there, is Mizzou too worried about him to take away Ben Sinnott? So you you are able to do a lot more as an offensive coordinator if you have your full allotment of guys. I know that's not rocket science, but um, I, you know, that's deserving to be pointed out. And obviously the offensive line situation, does do they still try the same offensive line or do they have their – the starters from last year play together for the first time. I mean, it's all storylines to watch and probably mm-hmm. deserve some focus throughout the week. Yeah. I mean, that that's, I, I will have, you know, depending on when you're listening to this, they may already be up, but we'll have position grades today. And it's one of the things that I talk about with the offensive line is that uh, there's the, the possibility that for the Missouri game, you get two offensive linemen back and ready for game action and Christian Duffy, who was a starter last year. So that would be good. And then John Pastore, who Chris Kleiman said was back at practice last week, who knows if he's going to be a, a, a problem solver or a solution, but he's another body to throw out there and at least try if you're K-State. And I think that's kind of the, they're the position that they're in because we saw that uh, multiple times on Saturday against Troy. The Wildcats were just kind of grabbing at things and trying to see what was going to stick for them on offensive line just to get some cohesiveness and something going. And I think your point on the pass catchers is really important to, to note because the fact that K-State's come out this year – and Keegan Johnson in, in limited use and not playing in game one, they have been able to now in in three straight games, or in two, two straight games, but three different pass catchers have had games of at least 90 yards receiving. Obviously, game one, it was R.J. Garcia and Ben Sennett. Now it was Phillip Brooks this past week. Jaden Jackson has also come through with some big catches. So you have four guys that have made plays for you in the receiving game already this season – and that's not counting the guy that we expect to be the number one receiver and the best playmaker at that position on this team for K-State. That's really encouraging, and so I think it's it's a good call because Missouri's not going to be able to put as much attention on all of those guys as maybe it would command, and Will Howard is showing that he's got a good enough connection with all of his receivers, and uh, I'm excited to, to see what Keegan Johnson on the field, uh, maybe in more reps, will look like for K-State this week against the Tigers. Also doesn't count Trayshawn Ward, which I imagine becomes a more of a weapon in the passing game as the season drives forward. A bonus storyline. 
since it's a seven o'clock FS1 game, this is not a storyline for this week. Do we get Tim Brando in two weeks when, <laughs> when Kansas State hosts UCF? It's, oh, Lord. People are saying. Uh, well, so uh, looking ahead, I, I hope the Cats aren't doing this right now, but D.Y. already looking ahead, not because he's excited for a night game in, in the bill, because he's concerned that Tim Brando will be on everybody's TV no, sets. This year, we don't have to be concerned. Tim Brando thinks Kansas State's like a top five team this year, if you've been paying attention to his predictions. so Yeah, he'll still find a reason to scream at fans. Okay, the Big 12 on Saturday, September 23rd, will have – Three FS1 games, 11 a.m., SMU at TCU, Oklahoma State at Iowa State at 3, and then K-State UCF at 7. So there are a lot of options there for, for Timmy B and the gang. I'd have to see what the rest of like the main Fox schedule looks like because they've had a lot more games this year. But it, I'm going to guess that they are either at UCF, K-State, or Oklahoma State, Iowa State would be my assumption. Pac-12 week four, so that is the mm-hmm. the week that Kansas State's hosting UCF. The Pac-12 has got the time, got the TV and time slots that week because Colorado, Oregon is going to be on ABC. UCLA, mm-hmm. Utah is on Fox. Even Oregon State, Washington State is four o'clock, or would be three central, I believe, or two central on Fox. Oregon mm-hmm. State, Washington State. Mm, well, Oregon State, Washington State. That could be a Benetti Heard game. Heard is a is a is a Washington boy up there. Uh, USC USC at Arizona State's on Fox at seven or at six thirty. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, one note here: we we said initially when we found out when K State was playing, how would some of the newcomers be treated in their first Big Twelve weekend? Some are playing their first one this weekend, I believe. I think uh, BYU and somebody might be going this weekend. Or UCF plays uh, plays their their first conference game, uh, I guess against K State. But there are at least one of them. I can't remember who exactly. Uh, I'll quit jumbling up my words here to get to what I was going to say. Cincinnati getting the host big noon kickoff uh, Oklahoma. In, against Oklahoma on Saturday, September twenty third. So they're uh, the the fans at least at Cincinnati before the game are going to be really excited about their welcome to the Big Twelve. We'll see how they feel after the game. Uh, when Oklahoma's offense runs up there, that game, there would be, there's probably going to be a lot of points scored in that one. I'm not sure either team is great defensively, but both would like to put up some points if they could. Emory Jones already won a, a Big 12 Offensive Player of the Week uh, in Week 1, and Cincinnati got a big win against Pitt over the weekend. So we'll have to kind of uh, see what comes out of that one. But a lot of good storylines in uh, all of all of those games uh, two weeks from now. I guess I'll ask you this while while we're here, D.Y. Um, anything from the Big 12 this past weekend stick out to you is important to note or surprising? And then uh, what are you looking forward to in the Big 12 this weekend? Well, you were right about this weekend. Houston gets their first uh, game as a Big 12 member, Conference yes. Action. They host TCU. So I think that's probably one to look at. Surprisers this way, I'll, I'll stick with Houston. Um, right after defeating UTSA, we're like, oh, not bad, Houston. Pretty good. Mm-hmm. Then they lose to Rice. And yes. not only did they lose to Rice, they were down by four touchdowns to Rice at one point. So Hey, but they came back to force overtime, you know? That was a good fight for Dana Holgerson and the they, boys. What I, what I learned about Houston is, you know, good job week one, but you are probably who we thought you were, um, yeah. to, to quote Dennis Green a little bit mm-hmm. there. I uh, Oklahoma State, not not a bad win over Arizona State. I thought that, that was a good sign for them. Um, we'll see if Oklahoma can navigate some distractions the next few weeks. The whole Jeff Levy thing. I, yeah. I, it's weird that they kind of got in their own way there. Uh, you know, Baylor hung on with, against Utah, then lost in, you know, heartbreaking fashion, yeah. to be quite honest. You, you led the whole game. You controlled the whole game. Like, man, we're about to redeem ourselves after the, a terrible week one loss to Texas State. So now, now it's week three for them. I, I forget who they have this week, but then you could be looking ahead to Texas, and you couldn't have, you couldn't have, you know, mapped out a worse start for your first two weeks to lose in that fashion. So, kind of yeah. concerned for Baylor moving forward. That that that's a that's a recipe at the beginning to where you kind of lose buy-in and, and potentially miss a bowl game. So uh, that's where I am with them. Iowa State. 
along with Iowa, knew it was going to be a low score game. Low scoring games, everyone competes, right? Mm-hmm. So no, no shock there, to be quite honest. And BYU's had two cupcakes, so we're not going to find out about them until this week. They play Arkansas. So that'll be an interesting one to follow. Um, don't think I'm missing anything yet. Texas Tech, um, they competed with Oregon like we thought. Yeah. Uh, couldn't couldn't uh, pull it out. So they're 0-2 start, but they're, none of those games are league games. So that, uh, that is still a team that can contend for a Big 12 championship, in my opinion. Probably bearing the lead. Texas beats Alabama. I thought, you know, I think it was probably a half hour into that game, maybe at the end by after one quarter or after a quarter and a half. I, I tweeted this, but I, I mean it. You could tell that Texas was a much better team. And I said, if they don't win by two scorers, they probably bit themselves again. Mm-hmm. I think they tried to at times, but Texas is clearly better than Alabama. I'm not writing Alabama off this year, but they don't have the same firepower and offense that you'd expect. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it comes down to the quarterback thing. For the last however many years, they've been so set and ready for who's the next quarterback after the current one. And, and now it seems like, they got to this offseason, and they were scrambling a little bit because you would have thought, okay, Jalen Milrow should be ready to go, but clearly he wasn't. Um, and, and they they brought in the Notre Dame transfer that wasn't any good at Notre Dame, and the fact that he was even an option probably said a lot about their situation. So uh, Alabama's still a good team, but they have a, a pretty glaring weakness, at least relative to what a lot of other top 10 type teams have right now at quarterback. Um you mentioned some of the, the teams that have started 0-2. Baylor will get win number one this week, I would think. They play Long Island at home. Uh, and then Texas Tech, they get Tarleton State at home. That should be a win as well. But both of those teams are in desperation mode, so uh, never a better time to get your FCS opponent in there. Uh, one notable game, Iowa State is on the road at Ohio. Um, Ohio <laughs> is, is only a two-and-a-half-point dog. Ohio, coincidentally, they played Long Island, Baylor's opponent, last weekend uh, in a 2017 (laughs) game. Ohio does not like to score points either. Their first three games of the year, they lost to San Diego State 20-13. They beat Long Island 27-10. They beat Florida Atlantic 17-10. So, uh, Tom Herman, loser. Um, But this is going to be another low-scoring game for Iowa State, it would appear, who – why are you going on the road to play Ohio? That seems like uh, Matt, Matt Campbell wanted to go home, man. <laughs> yeah, got to get a little bit more action for Matt Campbell underway. Uh, if I asked you right now, do you know who plays the primetime game on ABC this week? Could you tell me what game that is? Is it Colorado, Colorado State? No, that is a, like a late night kick on ESPN. It is Pitt in West Virginia, six thirty ABC. Uh, We'll see. I mean, those are two you know probably what? not very good teams this year, but West Virginia might be able to get that one. Pitt's a one-point favorite right now. Uh, I, you know what? I'm just going to call Pitt the uh, the Big 12 uh, punching bag if they lose. So they already yeah, lost I mean, to Cincinnati. It's <laughs> certainly possible. It was a good one for uh, Cincinnati. But, yeah, those are those are the notable ones. Unless, I, Wy- I, unless I Wyoming's going to pull off a, uh, a stunner and uh, win their second Big 12 game of the year at Texas. <laughs> Yeah. So, so who's, oh yeah, no, that doesn't make sense. So I was going to say, has your thoughts on Cincinnati changed this year? So they, they, they absolutely smashed Eastern Kentucky, maybe not mm-hmm. the most surprising thing, but they beat Pitt. Um, they have Miami, Ohio this week, I believe. And then they go to Oklahoma or then they host Oklahoma for big noon. Is that a team that the Sooners have to worry about now? You have to at least be moderately aware of what's going on there in the, in that circumstance because, um, I mean, I, like Cincinnati is, they're at least going to to prove that they can maybe have a little bit of of juice to them and a little bit of firepower. I still think, as much as I think that they're better than what I anticipated, it, it's only like assuming that they maybe win one or two more games than I, I thought. Like I probably thought of them more as like a four or five win team. Now I think that they can be more of like a five or six win team. Um, and that's probably a game where Oklahoma, depending on how much better or worse their defense has gotten from last year, Cincinnati could maybe hang around for a little bit, but I'm, I think they'll make too many errors. And as much fun as Emory Jones can be, and uh, I wanted him to be the guy at Florida, there's a reason why he transferred to Arizona State, and there's a reason he transferred to Cincinnati. 
Um, it just hasn't worked out yet for him yet. So I have a tough time believe it, believing it happens now. But they're at least a little bit more uh, scary than what you maybe thought. And, you know, them and Oklahoma State, they played two bad Power 5 teams over the weekend on the road, but they still won those games. And I think that was pretty important for the league as a whole to not drop those games because they easily could have. Um, so this was a good rebound weekend for the Big 12 in a lot of ways, and not just because Texas was able to get such a massive win. So I'll give Cincinnati their due for now, but it doesn't change how I feel about them uh, in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, I, I probably feel similar. For me, it's like they still have that, that Luke Fickle pedigree um, flavor to them. And the farther they get removed from that and the closer they get brought into the Scott Satterfield um, yeah. coloring, then it's probably worse for them. So it's, I, I wonder if they're one of those teams that just gets worse as the year goes on because they get less Luke Fickle and more Scott Satterfield. Uh, very possible. Very possible. Uh, kind of a weird weekend in the Big 12. This will be my last little note on it uh, so everybody can take stock. Uh, three Big 12 teams will go on the road – to group of five opponents this weekend. Throw that into addition to the fact that Texas Tech already went to one and lost in Wyoming. Iowa State at Ohio. Oklahoma is at Tulsa. And then KU is at Nevada this weekend. Uh, so so the Big one, 12 is really testing themselves with the G5 schedules this year. Which one has the most to be worried about? I'll, I'll go with my pick first. It's Iowa State. Yeah. When you play in play low-scoring games, you're always inviting disaster. Yep, especially since Ohio is a team that also appears very comfortable to play in those games. Um, I, and, like, th Iowa State is the worst of the three teams that are going to play those games. Oklahoma is Oklahoma. They should handle Tulsa on the road. They'll win 70 to 30 or yeah. something. And KU, I think KU is probably playing the worst of the three group of five opponents good. this week. Yeah. I mean, Jay Norvell left those guys high and dry, and they suck. <laughs> so uh, last year was not good for them. I don't anticipate they're good this year. And KU's offense is just going to overwhelm a group of five teams. So I, yeah, I think they, they handle it. If you Jim. asked me who I was most confident and who would win out of those three, I would say KU. Because yeah. I could see something weird happening with Oklahoma at Tulsa. And Tulsa, you know, every few years will pop off with a, a seven or eight win team that, that can have some fight in them. Yeah, definitely KU. We'll put it this way, Ohio and Tulsa – could both win at Nevada. Yes, yes, there you go. That's a good way to put it. All right, that uh, that will close things out for us. Any final thoughts that you have real quick before uh, we, we shoo off into the rest of our Monday and get ready to hear from Chris Kleiman tomorrow? If you're watching this on YouTube, go ahead and like the video, comment on the video, subscribe. If you're listening on an audio platform, whether it be Spotify, Apple, Google, whatever all that stuff is, um, go to our YouTube channel, K-State on our YouTube channel, and do all of that anyway. Also, K-State Online, we have an app. It's the On3 app. But you get, all your K get all your K-State Online content through the app. It's improving every day. It's You get notifications sent to your phone as well when a story hits, whether it be breaking news or not. Um, you can you know, obviously uh, arrange that the way that you want, but if you want K-State content you know, around the clock, at your fingertips. Obviously, you can go straight to kstateonline.com, subscribe if you're not, but obviously the app is a great way to do that. Yeah, it's an app that I actually use. Uh, you know, as you know, uh, my, my previous stop, there was an app, never used it once because it just was not, well, I did use it once to find out that I would never use it twice. Uh, the On3 app, it's the only way I access KSO on my phone. Also, uh, the YouTube crowd got to see I was flashing. My Illinois shirt came in. On Saturday, so the day after I uh, I actually needed it. Um, so a little bit of sadness there. Uh, also, the KU fans, very very vile and nasty uh, in my mentions for the food review. They did not like it, even though I gave uh, a good review of the food there, and I was actually complimentary of Kansas. All Might weekend. have been the porta potty comment. Might have been the porta potty comment. Yeah, they did not like the porta potty comment. So whatever, you know. Hey, Maybe don't have porta potties hanging around like that. I don't know. I will say I did not notice any actually inside the stadium this time, but there was a full row of them right there by the gates to get in. So uh, we'll see. Also, I was I was there supporting the Illini. I was not there to be anti KU. I, you know, I was I was friend of of the Fighting Illini player Keith Randolph, according to Alec. That's uh that's what he told me uh, how we got the tickets. I was like whatever. Uh, but uh, I will say this. I, I mentioned this yesterday. Um. 
the crowd there on a Friday night was very good in Memorial Stadium. And I said but at the beginning of the season, I, proje- I projected that K-State and KU would pre- play a night game again, you know, last next to last week of the regular season. If K-State and KU play a night game there, that will be an awesome crowd this year. And that will be something that K-State fans have n- never experienced. At least, you know, K-State fans in my lifetime have never experienced is a, a K-State-KU game in a loaded Memorial Stadium. It won't be as easy for, uh, for K-State fans. Assuming they yeah. continue on this, KU continues on this track and trajectory, it won't be as easy for K-State fans to get a ticket to that. Yeah, that is very true. All right, that will do it for us. D.Y. and I are out. We will be back on Wednesday to recap all the biggest things that Chris Kleiman said for his Tuesday press conference as he gets ready to preview the Cats and the Tigers as uh, they get to reignite this rivalry one last time until somebody makes a schedule for 75 years down the road, and then we know that uh, my my grandkids one day will get to see K-State and Missouri play each other in person. Um, but, you know, the college football scheduling works in – magical ways where we can't schedule games, you know, in a, in a short time uh, period. So we are out. We'll be back again later this week here on the KSO YouTube page, as well as over on kstateonline.com.